Season 2 of Notebook on Cities and Culture is brought to you by Carl Haley and Daniel Murphy. I've heard friends who have returned from Chicago trips call it the most American of all. American major cities. As someone who's lived there and who's used Chicago, does that does that observation mean anything at all to you? I think it does. I, I, I think it has something to do with being in the very middle of the country, and, and not, ge- not just geographically, but almost in uh, spirit, <laughs> soul. And I don't mean middle in the sense of, like, middling, but middle in the sense of there, there's a sense of where I think physically and spiritually maybe the country sort of meets in Chicago. I don't know. It, I, have you ever heard that people who aren't from the Midwest or maybe from New York or, or from L.A. or San Francisco or whatever, and they, they've never been to Chicago because they never had a reason to go, mm. and they're almost incredulous? Why would anyone go there? And I think that, I think we sort of wear that with a certain amount of pride. If you, if you don't know why you should come, then maybe you shouldn't come. And I don't know if that answers your question or not. But. Are, there, are there literally few reasons to go to It's Chicago. I mean, it's well, that's, huge. That's what I mean. I mean, there, imagine. But I, I, I hear this frequently. Um, people kind of asking me, what, you know, what, why would... And I'm always kind of a little stumped for the answer. I mean, because it's such a... As you say, there's a, a, a million reasons... Um, so, yeah, uh, Chicago, but Chicago's always gotten that kind of disrespect. I mean, it, it wasn't called the second city because it was necessarily se- in second place in population. It was called Second City by A.J. Liebling because of its because of his perception of Chicago's infer- infer- inferiority complex. So, um, but I think I think I think Chicagoans wear that with a certain amount of pride, and and. Uh, um, it's actually a wonderful place to live. To visit, I, I think you, you know. It's a. I, I think it. You need to. You need to spend time there, wandering it. It's not a place I think that I necessarily think would be the greatest city to visit on a two-day trip. No. Well, I'll take this show there. That'll give me a reason to go. I know I won't be stuck in Los Angeles. It is Notebook on Cities and Culture. I'm Colin Marshall, coming to you from San Francisco's Bernal Heights, sitting down with Peter Orner, author of a novel that, in in many senses, is thoroughly, I would say, Chicagoan, Love and Shame and Love, also author of a novel that is not particularly Chicagoan, The Second Coming of Mavala Chicago, author of the short story collection Esther's Stories, and the editor of two collections, uh, one of which is called Underground America, Narratives of Undocumented Lives, the other of which is Hope Defeated? Deferred. Hope Deferred, Narratives of Zimbabwean Lives. I'm... I, Despite having read the books, for some reasons the titles <laughs> get shuffled around in my mind. You know, they're a world apart, and yet you might also have read his work, uh, writing about short stories in the Rumpus or or elsewhere, many other venues. Tell me, what does whether for love and shame and love or anything? It, what what does Chicago give you literarily? I mean, besides having grown up there, and everybody's going to use the place they grow up. But what do you find fruitful with given your own literary proclivities with what Chicago has offered you? Well, I think, as you say, I did grow up there, and I, I grew up in, a, in a, a northern suburb where I could literally, from the beach, see the city rising, uh, you know, 25 miles to the north. And it, so it, it almost was, in, in my childhood, as much a mythical place as it was a real place. And I think that I, as I wrote, the, as I worked on this book in the garage that we are sitting nearby in San Francisco, um, I, you know, I, I think all our childhoods are myths to an extent, but I, mine was particularly placed in, in a geographic location. And that was, um, not necessarily almost, not necessarily being in Chicago, but seeing it from a distance and, and, and wanting to be there because I suppose it represented some kind of freedom or alternate life. Was, was Chicago to you not simply a proverbial City on a hill, and I mean, it, a, almost literally a city on a hill, but proverbially as well. Yeah, li- yeah, both, <laughs> both proverbially and literally. Um, it was. Is it place. upwards in altitude from uh, from where uh, you grew up? I, I, 
perhaps by inches. <laughs> okay. It's not not a very undulant place, <laughs> Chicago. Which I mean, by contrast, San Francisco must look like uh, just the, the, the Alps. Quite undulant. <laughs> uh, in fact, I think Chicago, because I grew up in a, in, in a, uh, a place called Highland Park, which is a bit higher because it's on the bluffs of Lake Michigan. I think Chicago is actually lower. Oh, okay. uh, from uh, so I was looking slightly down at it, but the buildings are tall, so it made up for that. And, as as a kid, I mean, it, it represented what to you? Like, oh, look at that cool place. As soon as I grow up, as soon as I attain my full rights as a, as a citizen or what have you, or as as an adult, I will. That is the kind of that is the, the life's pleasures are over there. Or what what did you think? I think that's part of it. I, I think it also represented it, you know, from the very cramped suburban life that that we were living. Mm. I think Chicago represented. Absolutely, an escape from that, um, and I and I watched it in real time. I watched my mother, in particular, who was from a small small mill town in Massachusetts. Mm. But Chicago was incredibly attractive to her. It 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 gave her an an outlet, and so she would often drive my brother and I just around the streets, which she was amazed by because she was from a small town herself. And so we would just go, we would just, just wander the streets in her <coughs> um, VW Bug for, for, it felt like days. Just and purely enthralled as she, she was. Maybe, maybe you were, I don't know, as she was for she sure. say, we're in the city, look around. That was what she would always say. If she was here now, she'd laugh about that because that was her big thing. If you're in the city, look around. And so that's kind of see what. There. Anything, mm. ambulances, uh, uh, um, uh, just uh, people wandering on the, walking down the sidewalk. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a sights. It was, it was life being lived. Mm. I think that was so attractive. There's this element of love and shame and love. Critics come back to, which is the idea that this this main character, well. There's a lot of characters, but per, what people see is the main character, uh, the most contemporaneous one with us, uh, this, this fellow who goes by his surname, Popper, that he was, his birthright as a city kid was taken away by the migration to Highland Park. I mean, what, is that a phenomenon you, you see in peers or yourself or this, this idea that, hey, I was, supposed to, I was supposed to be there, but you took us to the, a place, understandably, that you thought was safer, nicer, I mean... Um, to an extent, we all feel the same way. All of us who grew up in a suburb, I did right. too. Right. Well, I think, and I think it, you know, I, I, it's a common experience, and my mind was certainly not unique. And I, I, and I realized that. I, I think that that desire for something safer or calmer or greener or whatever, um, and and that that fleeing of the cities that happened in the late '60s, mid '60s, '70s, I think. Um, it was a phenomenon that I personally experienced, and I wanted to to look at fictionally because I felt, you know, we're always chasing something, and I, I think um, what my parents and people like them were chasing, I'm not sure they quite understood what they were even after, and and what they were leaving behind, which was um, a much more cosmopolitan life for a. A different life, and I, you know, it's not the it's not the biggest tragedy in the world. <laughs> Suburbs are not yeah. the tragedy that sometimes they're made out to be, and I make them out to be. But they're a convenient target. Mm. It, it's it's less the geographic issue than than the than the constant, I think, desire that we have as Americans. You started out saying Chicago's an American city. I think it's a, I think that's true, and I think that's a microcosm of looking at how Americans. Act and one of the things Americans do is chase stuff. I think <laughs> we, um, we do do that. Yeah, and so uh, perhaps that's what more of what I was after with um, chasing stuff without quite even knowing what we're chasing after. Mm. And I think maybe that's one of our biggest problems. Mm. It, is it? Is that something to be admired in Americans as well? I mean, it would take an outsider to answer this question, and we're two insiders. <laughs> but it seems like there's a yin yang, double edged sword. Choose your metaphor. That's America's tendency to chase things has made it what it is, but it's also made it what it is. Right. <laughs> I, I think you said it best. Mm. You know, what, what are we doing in, uh, you know, five or six countries around the world right now? With our, <laughs> so um, absolutely, I think it, 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 it is what makes us tick, and it also um, is what makes us um, our great weakness. Mm. 
You mentioned that flight from cities into suburbs in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and it happened in every American major city, some outside of America as well. And I wonder, I mean, you say they wanted to go to a place safer, greener. We're sitting here in Bernal Heights in San Francisco, in a city, very much in a city, mm-hmm. um, pretty safe and pretty green. I look around and I could hardly improve upon it in those terms. Uh, were things, I mean, I wasn't around to live in cities in the 60s and 70s. I, I guess the American cities were kind of on the ropes, kind of cr- truly crappy in some, in some sense. Maybe not so bad. I don't know. What do, you, do you think things have changed so much that we don't need? I mean, who, who, who would go from here? Who would live in Bernal Heights and say, God, I got to get to the suburbs. This, this is, I can't raise a kid here. Well, in a place like this, I think it's a, there's a lot of economic factors that are pushing people actually to the suburbs. Oh. The suburbs, in, in this case, would actually be cheaper right. than living in, in some instances in San Francisco where rents are going sky high, sky high. So they high. do say, I can't raise a kid here. Yeah, exactly, because I, I can't. Yeah. Um, but certainly, the, you know, they're, they're, I mean, you mentioned you know, what it was like in cities and why people were, in fact, leaving. And, 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 and absolutely, there was the threat of crime. There was disintegration of the schools and all of the reasons. That, that still exists for people to, to move out of cities. I mean, I live in San Francisco. It's a wonderful place. Are the schools particularly good? No. People are still having to, um, you know, there's a lot of pressure on parents to figure out um, what's the best for their kids in terms of education, public or otherwise. So um, these things still exist. But I think back in those days, I wonder if it was, I mean, I think there was a combination of real things people were fleeing from and also, you know, um, trying to reach some ideal that at that time was still an ideal. Everyone knows now the suburbs aren't an ideal. Right. So, but then, you know, I think things were still untested. Mm. And, and, and so. It seems you do have an interest, and maybe this is a common interest, but it seems you do have one in your writing of, of what happens to an ideal when, it get, when it gets put to the test, as as they all do, do you? There, there's a sense in which I guess any novelist can make their way there. But is that a sort of a is that a conscious thing, a conscious theme you like to go to in your mind? It's just personal fascination. You like to see how ideals get turned into something else when they meet with concrete. I don't know that I consciously do anything yeah, on the page, and that's something. So this is all after the fact. But I I remember when I was working on on Love and Shame and Love. I, I was starting to think about there's a, you know, there's this um, thing that Jews say, we say next year in Jerusalem, you know, and I, I'm sure it has an origin that is easily traceable on Google. But, um, but you know, it's kind of a, a thing people say. And, and also this idea of, of, you know, Jerusalem and Israel as being a promised land. And I think that I was, I, I think I worked because, you know, I, and I asked myself at some point, well, okay, so what happens when you get to the promised land? Because <laughs> it's never the promised land. And I, I, I think I, I, at some point midway through the book, I started to realize that that's what I was, that's what I was looking for. Um, some place to hold, some place to hold that idea is that, you know, we strive, we strive, we strive, and what happens when we get? Um, and something similar happened in my in my previous novel, which has to do with Namibian independence and the aftermath of Namibian independence. And I was so interested, because I was living in that country right after independence, I was so interested as 30 years you fight a civil war, uh, a struggle to achieve independence. Mm -hmm. Now what? Are you suddenly happy? Are are your families happier than they were before? Are are there less divorces? Are there less affairs? I mean, you know, and so I'm very interested in life going on amid a life and death struggle for an achievement that you know isn't going to improve anything, but you do it anyway, because of course we do it anyway. You know, y- Your name has come to be associated literarily with Africa as well as Chicago. D- tell me about the introduction of Africa into your life. Uh, I, when I was a, a, just graduated from college, I was casting around for something to do, and I stumbled on an opportunity to go teach in uh, Namibia, and this was in 1991, just after Namibia had become independent from South Africa, South Africa had ruled it as a mandate under apartheid, and uh, and Namibia became free, and they needed teachers, and I I sort of jumped at the chance. I could barely have located it on the map <laughs> at that time, and um, it's an incredible, beautiful place. It changed my life. I mean, it 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 it, it gave me you know a, a more than a year out in the desert to 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 read and teach and think and make wonderful friends and uh 
it, it became a huge part of my life and remains so. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it's why I do what I do is because I had that time to figure it out, to figure out what I wanted to do was write stories. And it, Namibia sort of gave me that um, among many, many other gifts. Not to be all sentimental. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, thinking of the, the novel, The Second Coming of Mavala Chicago, when did you, did you know you could write a novel of Africa when there? Or how, how long did it take before you thought, well, and this, this can actually be a subject? Because uh, I can imagine being so close to it, being there, it would never appear. You know, you're, you're there. You can't write about... I mean, there's a sense in which you can't write about the place you're in while you're writing, right? You hit it. I mean, and I, I, I for one, can't do it. I, I'm amazed by people who can, and I have great respect for them, but um, I can't write in the moment about what's happening to me. It has to be retrospective. Mm. So in the case of Namibia, I found that I was so incredibly homesick for Namibia when I got back mm. that I spent uh, all those years, I think it was 12, um, working on just little day-at-a-time pieces of that book to try and think about what I'd seen in a, in a fictionalized way, obviously, because I'm constitutionally incapable of telling the truth when it comes to certain things. And <laughs> my life is the, the, that one. <laughs> I can't tell the truth about my life. So fact checked me. But, um, but anyway, yeah, that was, uh, so it took a long time. And, you know, I just, you know, when you, when you, when you, when you, you know, you stumble on a place for no reason uh, under the sun and it becomes, and you become welcomed. I mean, I was a, a punk kid who had no business being in the classroom, no business um, telling other people how to... T- I, my, one of my jobs was to teach teachers. These oh, were people wow. who taught for decades. And, and I was a, a kid out of college with a BA in English. Um, it was a joke. And they <laughs> understood it was a joke and still accepted me into their homes and their lives and and i you know again i i I get all teary when i think about that but there's i mean my mind goes to a certain movie that i I watched on a plane and it's not it's not a great movie it's the last king of scotland Uh, um the movie movie. it's not not bad but i mean i expected a little bit more from it than i got but i enjoyed it uh the film for listeners who don't know it's it's about uh uganda about idi amin about a fictional young white scottish doctor who goes to uh, and he becomes i mean personal physician but the major theme of the film i would say tell me if you if you think this is wrong but it's the the gnawing the the gnawing burden of it's 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 the it's white man's burden of not feeling like he should be there that's the burden he's actually laboring under it's the burden of what are you doing in africa you're never going to belong in africa just this this eats away at him and eventually nearly kills him this this uh this notion shared by the Ugandans and, and him alike that this is not the place for you. Ever anything you everything you do here is going to be wrong by definition. How much what did that feeling ever exist for you? And what does it take to defeat it? I, it, it absolutely does. You you carry this around you, and I and I think that doctor in that movie is very well played. And 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 you know, he he's got that, but he's also you know in addition he's got the most murderous regime. <laughs> You know, one of the most murderous regimes in the 20th century right. to to observe from the point of view of a medical doctor is a right. pretty incredible um, scenario. So, you know, that was a lot of burden. But in my own case, I felt I felt unworthy of the people I was around because I was so unqualified to do what I was sent there to do. And what, again, what was I was so grateful for is people were. You know, they were like, we'll take you. You know, they, 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 they had a certain generosity, especially um, given the fact that this was a country that had been governed by apartheid, which is basically a racial classification system that puts white people at the very top. You, you'd think there would have been more animosity towards me um, from the community that I entered. And I, and I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm forever stunned that, you know, they kind of saw right through me. They saw that I was that I was scared and that I felt unworthy and I certainly was carrying this whiteness around with me like a like a my like my luggage. It's hard to get rid of. Yeah, and, and you know, totally. And 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 I you know, there was a man um named Mr. Freddy who was fictionalized in the novel as 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 a character called Obadiah, who is basically um a, a man who has had been teaching for thirty years and 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 takes one look at this kid, me, 
um, and 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 says, you know, you're all right. You're not as you're not as screwed up as you think you are. Mm-hmm. And and maybe maybe in your own small way, you you might have something to offer. But it's not because of you being a a American volunteer teacher who's here to help us. You actually might just be a member of our community because you're as screwed up as we are mm-hmm. in our way. Right. You know. And so that was sort of and in everything my life conflates with the fiction so uh, sometimes i get confused what happened and what i made up but that happened <laughs> you know i think of these books the, the the way you use the extent to which you use chicago's history or african history even be, beyond namibia mm-hmm. and i there must be a sense when you're in africa you know for for real or when your characters are it's it's a well at least at least i'm american at least i'm not belgian or French True. or Dutch. Do you, do you know? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Except you know, unfortunately, we have our we have some terrible, um, terrible uh, legacies in, yes. in in Africa. Among them, prop you know, helping to prop up the South Africans for for many years. So our our guilt is pretty strong, but true. We don't have. We're not the Belgians, <laughs> and, and that's you know that's not unhelpful to right. think about, um, or the Germans who, who in Namibia uh, Namibia were responsible for the first genocide of the 20th century mm-hmm. happened in 1901 in in, in Namibia. So, um, so yes, it's true. But I think we we should pat ourselves on the back too much for right. our for our African policy, which has been really horrible, especially considering the Cold War. Um, we got you know we got we got it we got we got we bought into that again, so we pitted uh, uh, people against each other and caused a great deal of death um, because of our Cold War policy. You mentioned before you went to Namibia, not necessarily you maybe have struggled to pin down Namibia on the map, and I'm sure that's true of many listeners. I mean, there the listeners come from across the world, but America is not unique in ignorance of Africa. So, what? I mean, Palin, now we stand. <laughs> yes, indeed. There's all the, the Palins of the world, certainly. But the what? What would you say? I mean, for those who have haven't picked up the Second Coming yet, or haven't read much about Namibia, what what have you found is is important to learn first about Namibia? You know, if you you, you know where the country comes from, you know it's in Africa. You could find it on a map. But what what are some what's essential to know? Well, you know, as you know, I. Mean, we, you know, when Sarah Palin actually thought it was all one country or whatever she thought. I mean, what is important to know about any African country is that it's got an individual history right. with with individual ethnic groups in most cases, right. with multiple languages, with with cultures that that are are as diverse as they are fascinating in 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 so many cases. And in my one small experience. Um, Namibia is an enormous country. So we used to say it was the size of Texas and Oklahoma put together, mm-hmm. but it only has a million point four people or a million point five people, mm-hmm. and so it's a small, very small country population-wise, and um, it's physically the most breathtaking place I've ever I've ever experienced in my life, mm-hmm. and the vast tracts of land where you'll see you know one house over a hundred miles. And then, you know, people will rush out of this house to see you because they haven't seen a car in a couple of days or whatever. Um, those were the kinds of experiences that I had traveling the country, which I continue to do long after I um, left there in my first time there. So I go back as much as I can. Um, it's yeah, physically dramatic, but combine that with the, with people that... Um, you know, I, my own experience, and I think I've, this has been replicated with a lot of people who visit there, um, is that you are you are brought in, you are you are welcomed into a place that is as strange and wonderful as as any place I can imagine. And part of that has to do with the fact that um, it it it's it's like a country that you know it's like an incredibly lonely place, and yet people. I, I think it. I think it sort of mirrors the the, the landscape in some way. It mirrors the experience of the people that I met, in the sense that um, I think it's a place where things are slowed down a lot, considerably. You know, and and for me that was incredibly important. And so you could slow down and actually, you know, like do what we're doing. This is very, very common in Namibia. You'd sit in your garden and you'd talk. Right. And Probably that, they aren't holding up a mic in you. <laughs> true, true. Although, you know, these days. But um, but that was, I, I felt, 
it was a place where you, I connected with people because we, we had the time and we sat and we talked. And that's what I did when I was there. And I loved it. And so I recommend people to go for that reason. You mentioned first the the, the vistas, I, I suppose, of Namibia, the the space. I mean, I envision a lot of space in sure. a country the size of those two states, one huge, uh, that has a million people. Mm-hmm. Tell me, I mean, you grew up in a dense, well, you grew up near a dense city, went to a dense, the Chicago, you, you live in a dense city now, San Francisco. What psychologically did the space that you hadn't don't have now probably and hadn't had then what did that what did that give you psychologically whether in terms of writing or whatever you were working through i'd never been in any place like it i mean i was i was like i was so stunned and i was so lonely and i was so uh freaked out when i when i remember my first you know getting my post and going to my school which um took four or five six hours from the capital um on on a on a on a on a gravel road and then a, then a, then a not much of a road at all. Mm. Um, and then you'd get out there and, 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 and there you were. I, I, it was almost a place where you, you sort of got to know yourself as much as you got to know the few people that you were able to be with because it's such a small population. Right. And for me personally, I, I think it, 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 it allowed me to, I mean, I, I, it's hard to even kind of articulate it exactly, but it, you end up like coming out of your door in the morning and looking at, at miles and miles of veld and then mountains in the background. And, and, you know, it's like you could walk and walk and walk and walk and walk. I mean, I'd never, I'd never been to a desert before. I'd never, I hadn't spent much time in the mountains. So for me, it was like it was like there was the world I, for the first time. I mean, I know this sounds over dramatic, but that's what it was like. I was like, I wasn't closed in. I wasn't hemmed in. I was able to um, experience, yeah. And there is a sense in which being in a different place makes you learn. Sometimes it feels like primarily you learn about the places you came from because you see them in, in starker relief i mean certainly los angeles and san francisco are not ultimately that different but i find myself learning more about los angeles the more i'm in san francisco with this specific trip because i'm usually in los angeles being in namibia i mean what 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 did you what was then cast into relief about about chicago or even san francisco now having that experience what do you what do you see that you think you might not see about living in american cities or, or where wherever uh living in non-namibia places i mean what did namibia teach you about that well i, I remember i mean i as i mentioned i think namibia was the place where i realized that i could actually do i was able to concentrate and 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 start writing stories and and i remember much of the time i was in namibia i was writing this incredibly goofy short story which has never seen the light of day. Mm. And it was about a guy who, for some reason, can't seem to get out of the mall mm. in suburban Chicago. <laughs> and he's trapped in the mall. I don't know why he just didn't go out the exit. I don't know what I was, right. what, what, what the premise of this story makes no it's sense. It was a Kafka mall. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, I, I, you know, and, and it was a very bad story, but I worked on it um, on the school typewriter. Mm. For, for hours and months and 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 I mean that's so I I remember thinking there I could sort of see I mean I guess now metaphorically it does work I was trapped in some but it, then I had no idea then I was just writing a bad story about a guy in a mall and but you know but I think that it allowed me to see where I was from and 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 that I think was invaluable and I you know I, I you know I I'm sure I, I would have been fine had I not gone there and, and life would have gone on. But I think it, it, it was a, um, one of those events. And as I get older, I'm starting to realize quite how important it was for me to break through and to be totally alone. And, you know, in 1990, there wasn't any instant communication with back home. So when I was communicating with my family and friends, it was through letters, which, you know, came once a week, uh, like I was on a ship or something. So, um, yeah. By the way, and this, this makes it vivid, I think, for the listener to underscore this, about the school typewriter in 1990. That tells you something about the state of uh, Namibian schools in, the, in those days? Yeah, absolutely. And it was, you know, the principal was kind enough to lend me it, and it would sit on my desk because they weren't using it, you know, 
I mean, it was the, it was the secretary's the school secretary's supper, but at night I'd bring it home to my room, mm. and then I would um, then I would sit there and clack clack clack, which was it was a you know, a, a great time. And I remember one time um, there was a funeral, and uh, all of the teachers left the farm. This was a farm school, not a farm. And they left to go to the funeral, and they asked me if I would mind being in charge. And I remember, um, so I was in charge of all the kids, mm-hmm. about 120, 150 kids, I can't remember. Mm-hmm. And so I was the boss for the day because all the teachers were gone. But I was writing. I was, I was suddenly I was the writer guy. And so I didn't want to be disturbed. And uh, I remember they would knock on my door and I would be typing really loud. And anyway, and one time this kid, I still feel guilty about this, so I think of this story a lot because I think it's one of the terrible things I've done. And when you asked me about the typewriter, it made me think of it. This is apropos of absolutely nothing. But one kid, I, I think his name was Marcus, wonderful kid. <laughs> he did not deserve what happened to him. He popped, his head popped up right by the window where I was working. So I was typing, and he was his, and and I punched the window because I was so mad that he was interrupting me. It was terrible. I mean, this is the kind of idiot. I was a loose. Punch right through him. I punched right through the window. Oh my god! And then Marcus ran into the veld, and this is maybe you can get a sense of what the land was like. He kept running. He and I and I completely horrified and guilty and terror i shouldn't tell this on the you know and it, because it makes me i mean i'm still guilty of war and and i chased because i thought his you know i thought i've got glass in his eyes you know and um i chased him and chased him and finally ran him down and he was fine and everything was fine and i didn't but um that typewriter every time i think every time i think of a typewriter i think of me in there and them trying to disturb me as i wrote my stupid story about <laughs> chicago this is but I think writers, it's not an uncommon thing to be one place physically and one place in your mind mm. and then realize later on where you had been physically at that moment. Because I'm always writing, so I'm never quite in the place I am right. until after. Isn't that mm. terrible? <laughs> I mean, if it's, if it's what works for you, it's what works for you. <laughs> but, but then you don't experience where you are. Right. Well, so, you, 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 must, yeah. you must experience where you are because you, you write about it later, which tells me anyway that you... Yeah, you, being able to use it fictionally means you experienced it, though, doesn't it? True, true. I, I, but I think I think we're it's a, it's a terrible way to live sometimes <laughs> because I think you. Why should we have to live stuff after the fact? But I think that's what, it, in my case, what it happens is that I do. I live after the fact in places, and then I fall in love with them after. Given given the prevalence of. African sprinters in the Olympics and whatnot. I'm, I wouldn't have even bothered chasing a kid. Who, you know, I would just, you know, forget it. But Marcus was fast. That's true. <laughs> now, tell me, you were writing a short story then, and he was bugging you. Mm-hmm. And it, the short story obviously they wanted is to play baseball. I was teaching them play baseball, oh, okay. and 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 they wanted to play. And, but it was my writing time. Right. Anyway. We've got to, It's important to carve out the time. You know, whatever you're writing, right. you happen to be writing a short story then, and, and that anybody who reads your work knows that i mean sure there's the collection esther stories but there's the columns on the rumpus mm-hmm. and that form that form seems to seems to have been more important to you than than the average writer of, no, of novels uh what what if what a short story is reading or writing and what, what what do they give your practice wow uh i mean i love stories over anything else i i, I enjoy reading novels i'm in the middle of magic mountain right now which i can't seem to put down um but but stories have that uh, explosive quality that that I am constantly in need of, and uh, I actually have a new story collection coming out, so I'm I feel very much back into stories, writing them, which has been a, a really nice thing for me to to do. Because and my I think of my novels as basically story collections that are pretending to be novels. I mean I'll say that publicly, uh, and and I and I seem to be getting away with it. But <laughs> but but I to me a story collection is the highest form, right? Aside from poetry, which I can't do. Hmm. I love poetry, but I could never do it. So it does it seems like that's a challenge for many novelists because I don't know if this is just because of the way publishing works, but so, some love the short story form so they have to then make short stories take short stories and make them into a sort of novel with it as secretly short stories some essayists you know oh you will you, you maybe you want to embed those essays in a novel so that you can have a novel or some poets you may maybe you want to embed poetry in this novel like it's things get pushed toward 
becoming novels. I don't know whether that has to do more with the way publishing is or the way readers are. Their minds are used to picking up a novel, so you have to smuggle things in the form of novels. What do you think it is? You know, I think it's... I mean, I think there's the publishing pressure, but which I think is very real, and I think that there's some novels that are squished into... that, that aren't novels that are made so. And then, I, I guess what... I mean, I guess my... My, what I try and do, I I think, is that I mean my books I think are weird, so weird that they're not story collections masquerading as novels as much as they are many many pieces brought together into some kind of whole, mm. but they don't stand alone as stories. My chapters so that they don't quite fit the model of a novel and stories, which seems to be somewhat in vogue, but also also is a very old form. Mm. I mean novels and stories pieces fragmentary books that come together to become a whole is something that isn't anything it's not a new commercial moniker it's something that's been around for 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 ages and ages and you know i think of my one of my favorite books of all time isaac bobble's the red cavalry stories that's a novel Hmm. in a way it's also a great story collection What's the difference? I don't. I don't care, <laughs> you know. And so I think, in my case, I hope. I ho- I hope to write just these books that you could, you know. And but yeah, am I pressured into putting a label called a novel on them? Yes. Mm. And I think probably because in those nice cases, these aren't story collections in in the sense of how we think of story collections. So it has to be called a novel. But mm. I like to think of them as books. Yes, but pure books. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to, you know, call them books of fiction. And the new novel, Love and Shame and Love, it almost reads, I mean, I, it feels in a sense, I'm, I'm a fan of experimental fiction, and I, I, see, I certainly feel an experimentalism in the form of it, but at the same time, it's, it's also, it seems super accessible as, as well. It's, I don't know quite how to put it, whether that's a function of subject matter or language, but you could, I could as easily call it, I, to somebody who likes experimental fiction, I would say, oh, read this book, Love and Shame and Love. It's experimental. <laughs> to someone who hates experimental fiction, I say, oh, this is a book that's, you know, it's full of a family and perfect. people. And I, run with that whole, that's a perfect, <laughs> I love this. I, yeah. that's, that's all I got, but that's what, I, you could do that. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I want to know how you look back on the book and how do you think, did you think that they're, you said that these things aren't conscious, mm-hmm. but do you see, do you see that? in the book yourself or do you see it's a bit being more of a middle way rather than two things at once i i th- i think any any book and not speaking for my own but I, as a goal of you know of any work i think any great work is experimental in its own way you know even even books that seem to be whatever tr- traditionally structured Whatever that means, you know, I mean, Bleak House is incredibly experimental. What he was up to with the, the, the multiple narrations and the, the um, you know, the, 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 the different tone, tonal experiences that you have in, in a book like that. Moby Dick is, is the ultimate in experimental fiction, as far as I'm concerned. I can't believe the things that Melville gets away with in that book. Especially the whaling chapters. The, the, not, not whaling, the, the whaling chapters, but the, the, yeah, the, the, the subject of whales. Right. You know, the, the, that, so, you know, I think that there's, I, 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 I always am drawn towards books that are experimental in, in the grand sense that that is. And that includes books that I think would be today, would have that label. But I'm always very wary of the label that we put on books in general you know that why does there have to be this division and so maybe you know I, I, what you're saying in the best sense is that is that if we can do away with those labels we can look at books in a, in a, in a different way and we can meet the experimental people in the whatever traditional realist whatever that you call them people meet because this is all about generating emotion through sentences and and that's what it's all about and so and i think it's always experimental if it's not it's a problem uh, then you're just you're just l- refining a little bit some existing model and probably not refining it ultimately sure. and, and, and which can be certainly great but it's not quite what i would i 
what I would hold out as an aspirational thing from, from you know, for me, for what I like to read and what I like to write. No offense to it. In fact, if I could write a straight up novel that had a beginning and an end and sell it and make a movie, I would love it. I have, I simply do not have the ability. So I'm not, I'm not um, dissing <laughs> that, that. I just, I like to, I like every book to be something different. It reminds me, I think it's, it's a famous, I want to say, Walter Benjamin quote, that every great work either dissolves a genre or founds one, or maybe does both, maybe makes its own self-dissolving genre. As a reader, is that, is that a sentiment you can get on board with? I totally. I mean, you know, and, and you know, who's going to argue with him? But, but that's, <laughs> uh, that's, that's absolutely, and I, and I think that, you know, that's a big, sweeping, grand statement, but if you, if you, if you take the books you love, um, they probably will, to a certain extent, fit that. Um, I know it. I, I, you know, a book like Gene Tumor's Cain, desire, you know, breaks desire is a, a book that's very important to me. That Babel book I mentioned, Eudora Welty's Golden Apples. I mean, talk about experimental. Mm. So, um, you know, there, there are, there are, you know, and I and people would point to many more, more radical examples than I just did. But I think you don't have to go very far. Mm to find radical examples in my view um not that you shouldn't go far we should but indeed certainly uh, never too far but you know there's something listeners might wonder about i mentioned at the beginning of the interview you you have the two collections you've edited uh, on undocumented american lives mm-hmm. and narratives of zimbabwean lives and of course zimbabwe is, is not namibia mm-hmm. it's still in africa but tell me how you came to edit stories of zimbabwe I, uh, Namibia is a neighbor of, of Zimbabwe, and it, when I lived in Namibia in the early 90s, I was on a school vacation, and I visited Zimbabwe for the first time. And um, unlike Namibia, where the culture had been so destroyed by apartheid, um, and, you know, for example, there's not many Namibian writers, and the reason for that is because uh, Bantu education uh, did such a did such a good job of suppressing people that that the, the, the Namibian writers didn't really emerge until after independence. Mm. Zimbabwe was different. Zimbabwe became independent in 1980 and has an incre- had an incredibly vibrant uh, a literary scene, art scene. Zimbabwean artists are some of the most famous artists in Africa, mm. um, sculpture in particular. And I visited there and was totally blown away by how different it was. Mm. It's in Namibia. Namibia is where I lived and where I have my heart is, but Zimbabwe I was very interested in. So it's not like you think you're going from Austria to Germany or something, way, but really the, yeah. the divide is much bigger. It was a huge divide. I mean, culturally and historically, Zimbabwe is a very, very different experience. And, you know, Zimbabwe had a great, great future ahead of itself in 1980. And unlike, um, you know, South Africa or other countries that sort of made use of their independence in very, very positive ways for the people, Zimbabwe went the other way mm. with incredible promise. And so in 2009, 2008, I became interested in, um, there was a, it was a, a very important election in, in 2008 in Zimbabwe where it seemed as though Mugabe was actually going to lose. Then, of course, he got scared and sort of stole the election back and uh, pretty complicated. But anyway, I decided uh, with a Zimbabwean friend of mine, Annie Holmes, to edit um, a book of Zimbabwean stories. So we went to Zimbabwe and South Africa and interviewed uh, Zimbabweans about their experiences under Mugabe. And um, we learned a great deal, and it was an incredible experience to be able to talk to people and how they endure, and in a lot of cases don't endure because so many people have died, uh, what's been going on there. It's it's a common perception of, of Zimbabwe from outsiders to think that what's everything a lot, a lot is wrong there and it's all the fault of robert mugabe and i of course any any situation is more complicated than that but i wonder how, how much more complicated i mean it seems like a lot you can lay at his feet but not everything certainly so interesting I, my co-editor annie holmes and i would have this discussion all the time you know you, you you're you're dead right it's not you know, you can't lay it at his feet, and yet, <laughs> yet, if his feet weren't there, um, you know, I, 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 I have a very strong feeling that the, the mess that he and his cronies have made of this country wouldn't have happened. You know, it's it's human greed. What what I think is a, is a strong explanation for what for what's gone down in Zimbabwe. But as you say, 
it's very complicated, which is why we wanted to go there and talk to people at right. the source. And so we, we, we started to understand um, at the very onset of independence when, when, when particularly American progressives were celebrating Zimbabwe, a lot of, um, American, uh, a lot of the American left we're using Zimbabwe as a here. Look, this is what this is how it can go. Mm. This is and and they were right because the education was good, the healthcare was good, uh, and it was all becoming clear that this was going to be a rising African country and that they were going to do it their way. The problem was is even at the very onset, Mugabe was threatened by minority groups and anyone who he felt was going to. Um, stand in the way of his political party and, and his political party's exclusive power. And so, you know, he started to erode even the good things right away. And so, um, so I think you can trace it to certain decisions that he and his party made. Um, but, uh, did it begin long before Mugabe? Yes. It began, you know, when, when, you know, when white colonialists <laughs> came to Africa in the first place. So, um, and, and yeah. I'm reminded of an interview I did a few years back on the previous incarnation of the show, The Marketplace of Ideas, with B.R. Myers, an expert on North Korea, who happened to grow up in South Africa and has much to say about uh, his, his thoughts on the various townships he felt the government lied about the purpose of. But that's not the point. He, he writes about North Korea, which is a regime, I think, not entirely incomparable to Mugabe or other... They're friendly, too. <laughs> they're, 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 they're friendly, really. They're buds. Yeah, they're, North Korea and, and, and Zimbabwe, I think, are, are not, not, uh, not unclose, let's say. Well, they, they, they may both... Both regimes seem maybe to have the idea the world is against them. Yes. Uh, they're standing against the tide, right. and they could do good, if only. They, they, they didn't have so many enemies. I mean, it seems like both now the Kim Jong-un regime and... and and Mugabe, uh, despite the vast differences between them, uh, bo- both both sort of fear motivated. It seems like but fear is maybe fear at the top is one of the biggest problems. These two high profile uh, basket cases they're called share. Right, and and as you say, it's a, it's fear is very human. You know, it's human to to behave the way that they behave. Inhuman what they do about that fear. But I think you're right. They 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 like to think of themselves as being. You know the countries that are oppressed by the rest of the world, and, and you know, and, and to a certain extent, you can sort of see what they what they see, which is that that's the case. But why do they have to, um, you know, brutalize their own people because of their own insecurities? Mm-hmm. Um, is something that psychologists and <laughs> would have to. I mean, you ha- it'd be fascinating to, mm-hmm. to to really look at these people especially Mugabe who see you know Mugabe has about four or five advanced degrees mm-hmm. you know he is a he is a he is a extremely brilliant man um he has to have he has to see what he's done and he has to somehow justify it to himself nobody's that insulated he's yeah. got to just have an explanation yeah i mean you know and some people say well he's nuts i'm not sure he's nuts i don't think that that answers it i think it i think it's a deep rooted um uh, uh, you know, need that he has, and fear of of losing power, mm-hmm. and uh, and that has to go back way before he became, um, you know, president of Zimbabwe when he was in prison. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, you know, these are these are things that um, are complicated. But again, at a certain point, you have to start looking at what he's done, and not not some of the you know the root factors are important, but. And you know, we just got to get rid of this guy. It, it does. I mean, if I were an African dictator, well, this is an imaginary leap, but for, for many of them, I would think the remaining ones, they might say, well, maybe I'm not as bad as Charles Taylor. Right. Maybe I'm not actually <laughs> nuts like right. he seems to have been. But my. Yeah, man, as you mentioned. But uh, yes, exactly. But maybe they think that the fate of Charles Taylor awaits them should they ever fall from power, no matter what the world has already decided. And, and in Robert Mugabe's case, of course it would. So mm-hmm. what would you, so what do you, you know, what do you do when you're a guy like him? Mm-hmm. You know, you're not suddenly going to give it up. So, um, you know, it's very, and I mean, in, in talking to people for Hope Deferred, we, you know, I talked to a, a cop, we, for, we did an interview for, uh, of a former police officer, uh, who was, um, maimed in indescribable ways which i'll i'll leave 
for the moment, but in, in ways that are, you know, the torture was so significant he had to be, you know, airlifted and, and brought to Canada where he was survived a number of surgeries to actually live to this day. But he said that, look, he's like getting rid of Zimbabwe, uh, getting rid of Mugabe is, is not the answer, that the, 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 our country's problems are, are, are um, so deep because of this regime and and what what has worked on the psyches of of people who had to live in it that cutting off the head isn't isn't the answer and and we heard that a lot so um it's dire <laughs> you know i i have a lot of hopes because i think that what i what i found there for this book and why we call it hope deferred is that there's going to be hope you know that we're just deferring it um but that um that the resilience of of people who've endured this kind of years of horror um is hopefully going to make for a better society once we once we clear that away but it's going to be a while and what parallels can be drawn between between that situation and, and the ones in in underground America? I mean, we we're in San Francisco right now, and I'm from Los Angeles, both centers of uh, Mexican and Central American migration into the U.S. And both places with many an undocumented worker. Los Angeles, admittedly, with many many more than San Francisco. Uh, it almost it, Los Angeles almost is built on a sort of stratum of uh, of undocumented labor. Yeah, um, Chicago has as many other places. Right, yeah. yeah, so that it goes beyond. But it's it's mo- how most visible, I guess, in Los Angeles right. to some extent here as well. But it seems like there the fear is not at the top, but at the bottom. Indeed, nobody at the top here is is very afraid, unless it's about political capital. It's it's the people who are afraid of getting sent back to um, well. They wouldn't. I was going to say getting sent back to Tegucigalpa, but they always say Mexico, and they only get sent back that far. <laughs> right, right. I, I, you know, I, I mean, working on that book was also eye-opening. I mean, one of the things that's been great for me in doing these um, nonfiction books is that I've, it gets me away from my desk and away from my own memories and my own life mm. and my own make-believe world, and I get out and I like you. Um, I travel around and I sit and talk to people in a in an extensive, intense way. And so, when it came to immigration and undocumented people, this was in 2006, 2007, when there was talk of an immigration bill going through, and Bush was actually supporting it. Um, you know, and then there was incredible backlash. Almost uh, surprised, I think, it surprised the mainstream Republican Party. Um, and I got interested to, in the way that the media portrayed undocumented illegal people. And um, so I decided to try and make a book of stories and started out just talking to people that I knew who were undocumented and radiated out from there around the country with a great deal of help from um, other editors and, and interviewers. But I, I guess I guess what I found is that, I mean, more most importantly, that as you say, the foundation of LA is yes. based. I mean, these are these are people who are as American as we are, and we all know it. Right. <laughs> and and you know the fact that we put this distinction on their heads, you know, drives me crazy. And, and I wouldn't want to live in Los Angeles ex- if it wasn't you know this half Mexican and Central American. That's yeah, that's it's that's that's a lot of the reason I want to be there is because of that raw influence that's on it. You know, but I wouldn't want them to go away because that's kind of why I'm there too. Right, because they make up the fabric of, of our country. And, and, you know, certainly many, many Mexican-American and South, uh, Central American citizens, uh, but also the people who aren't citizens are, are as much a part of this country as, as anybody else. And, and what I, my agenda, my point in that book was to just to talk about their experiences living in the country that they live in. Mm. And, and, and uh, you know... Just to go back to the Namibia stuff, I wish that people would be as welcoming to them as 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 they are to Americans abroad, mm. or or let's say Americans who visit Mexico, uh, how welcomed we are there. Yeah. It's it's That's I, been my experience certainly. I think it's disgusting, but you know this is um, you know, but as you say, it becomes a political football, and uh, we're talking about millions of, of of families here, millions of of lives, and um, you know, I I think it I think there is a great deal that we have to do in order to understanding people's experience. And so our, our book, Underground America, was one attempt at saying, hey, you wanna, let's meet these people 
in ways that are deeper than maybe some of the superficial things you read about or your superficial contacts you have with undocumented people because we all have contact with them. Um, but I think that I think we I encourage deeper connections with everybody. I think that's sort of what my whole point is, you know, in gen- in general with my work is I try and if we if we have that deep connection, then you can then you get the stories, mm-hmm. and then I mean, I'm not saying everybody's saints. And in Underground America, we interviewed ex gang member from L.A. who's now living in an undisclosed location because if we, we disclosed that he would be deported, but he's doing actually very very nice very great work uh with youth uh, getting them away from gangs Mm -hmm. and this is somebody who you know was involved in some very brutal stuff so people can be rehabilitated and uh and our country is made up of people who have made mistakes and are now working towards a you know the greater good of their own communities and i think that's important Mm -hmm. now i remember reading an article about you where there was a quote saying something like, if Peter Orner lived in Brooklyn, he would, the, the, the Brooklyn literary establishment would immediately put him, put him at the top. You know, he'd, he'd be riding high there, but he chooses to live, for some reason, in the, in the San Francisco Bay Area. This is the New York Times, so, you know, uh, grain of salt. But uh, I, whether or not you believe that's, I mean, who, I guess who could ever believe it about themselves? Oh, if I was over there, I'd be up the top. But it raises the question of, what uh, what you find San Francisco gives you as a place for writing? You teach here. You teach at San Francisco State, but the 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 city itself. What what does it give you in terms of being being a place you can create? I think it gives me uh, you know a home, a home, <laughs> and I I wandered around a lot of years and without one. Uh, my Chicago is my home in my head, but I don't physically live there. My family's there, so. Um, you know what this place has given me is is everything. It's given me a place to to come from and to work from. I don't tend to write about San Francisco. I don't feel like I know it well enough yet. But it has given me a place um, to feel uh, welcomed, and um, and I I think I I think that's been great. So you know, I couldn't afford to live in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> but having experienced so many real places, you know, San Francisco has so much built up around it his, historically and. And emotionally, and it's 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 kind of it's the second most popular tourist city in in, in the country after D.C. Mm-hmm. Tell me what what can you say about the what what you've seen about the the real concrete place of San Francisco? The, the, what what you what no one would know if they have the images of uh, cable cars and wharves and and Transamerica pyramids. It, it's uh, the the actual. Uh, the, wow, what do you experience about San Francisco in the in the way you experience in a real way somewhere like Chicago or Namibia or Zimbabwe or wherever? I sometimes get into trouble when I talk about San Francisco because uh, I I'm critical. Uh, I see. <laughs> but I think that that's uh, you know that didn't Martin Luther King say you have to be critical about your <laughs> your country in order to love it? Um, so I'm critical about my city you know, and I and I still love it. But I think that I think San Francisco has as I we were talking earlier before we went uh, before we were recording that it's become a place where um, middle and lower income families are being priced out every day. And I um, have spoken up about this to, to, and, and often get criticized because um, people seem to like the fact that it's becoming as wonderful as it is. And I live in this great neighborhood, but I have neighbors uh, getting evicted uh, two doors down. I've been here six, seven years. I got a house next door that is being gutted and being remodeled into a into a show palace a mansion. Um, so. I should say something positive, <laughs> and that is, and that is, it's a, it's a place where I think people do, where ideas do clash, mm. and I think, um, I think it's not a place that's afraid of of talking about about this, and I think that, but I think gentrification is becoming the story in this town, and um, and I'm I for one am very interested in exploring it further, but there's a reason that there's gentrification is because it's a wonderful place to live and it's not just the climate and the beauty of the place but there's something in the spirit here that is you know kind of live and let live and i think that you know san francisco's always been famous for that and i think that's well earned and i think i i that's why i love this place is because it it is a place that has welcomed everyone you know we're well we're and we're certainly more welcoming towards um, undocumented people than other places. We could be better at that, 
but um, but we're a sanctuary city. Um, you know that distinction sometimes gets you know moved around mm-hmm. in different ways. So so I find that it's a place where I think that's its great strength. Aside from all of the historical and its beauty and its location and its climate, we're sitting. You know, I was I was going to say it's December, but it's not. It's actually September. But anyway, so it's getting toward December, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So uh, can we leave San Francisco with with a warning? I mean, is is this the warning that it, it's you know, watch out, San Francisco? You're you're getting a little rigid. You 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 make it hard to build. You might not be able to not being able to accommodate uh, the the less rich. That's going to har- that might harm you in the long run. Even though even though you you love to preserve yourself, preserve an idea of yourself, you may get rigid and you may lose what is intellectually, aesthetically driving you. Absolutely. And, and as a fiction writer, story writer, what you lose are the stories. Mm. And if you have a homogenation, a homogeny of economics, mm. of ec- you, I think that you, you're, you're going to lose your, um, you know, your... Let me give an example. We have a, a place called Charlie's down the way. It's our cafe. Mm. Um, it's you know, it's our. It's not the. It's not beautiful. It's not fancy. It's not your coffee's not. I don't. Sorry, Charlie. But the coffee's <laughs> fine. The Kenya is really good. You're improving, but but it's you know it's it's but it's a place we all meet in the neighborhood, mm. and you know Charlie's being threatened because there's a really nice cafe down the way which I also like, mm. which is you know very fancy, very yuppie, and 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 a place that you know is is great. But it's I think that you know I think we 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 are in danger, and this isn't just in San Francisco, but it's everywhere. You lose you lose a great deal if you have. Um, if people have to leave and only wealthy people come in and I, you know, I, I've gotten attacked. I, I wrote a piece in the New York times recently where I sort of laid this out and I got attacked a lot by owners in the neighborhood and, and owners across the country saying, you know, you asshole, what are you talking about? You know, you're saying that renters are so great and owners, you know, are just all diabolical, which, you know, wasn't what I was saying. I was telling a story about my neighbors. I was, that's all I was. I'm not a, pundit or anything mm. but i do think that i think the i i think if you look at more wealthy upscale neighborhoods where are the stories mm. literally i'm you know i'm totally serious i think we hard to kind of, find them yeah hard to find them mm. you know people live behind behind taller fences behind mm. i don't know i think we lose our we lose our sense of community if we if we um if we don't make sure that uh, that we preserve economic diversity, and how do you do that? You know, I'm just a fiction writer, but I think that there are ways in which you can make sure um, that that neighborhoods don't entirely go one way. Um, I know this is very complicated, but I I think it's an important issue that people should think about. Be warned, San Francisco, <laughs> the city I've been sitting in here in Bernal Heights is the specific neighborhood with Peter Orner, author of Love and Shame and Love, The Second Coming of Mavala Chicago, Esther Stories, the editor of those two compilations we discussed, uh, Underground America, and Hope Deferred. And as well, you've, you can read selections of his columns. He's written for The Rumpus or The Times. You can find those all on his site, PeterOrner.com, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. In any case, dot, PeterOrner.net. <laughs> Peter, thanks for taking the time today. Thank you, Colin. A real, real pleasure, too. And thank you for coming over to my house. Thanks for inviting me. It's been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with all of the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. And special thanks to everyone who backed this season on Kickstarter. Danny Bolson, Brad and Laramie on Movies, Paul Doyle, Umberto Grant, Matt Howie, Andrew Hovenick, Mark Hines, Mary Gillander, Eric Graham, Will Graham, John French, Andrew Philippon Jr., Kimberly Hahn, Chris Kay, Andy Cooney, Mark Larson, Rebecca O'Malley, Michael O'Regan, Gail Poole, Blake Riley, Superfan Giovanni, Aidan Nullman, Adam Schaefer, Rob Schultz, Scott Schenker, Cam Smith, Kevin Smokler, Adam Sutherland, TSD, Thomas Unterberger, Matt Warren, and Wayne Wright.